have here a headshot taken by um, our colleague uh, Jeremy Mayu from Pearl Studios. Um, make sure you do so um, before you leave today. We'll make sure then that we get those to you um, via the emails that we've been corresponding. So I'm Chrissy Dura, the Director of Alumni Relations here at the University, and uh, this business indicator series has been something that we look forward to for a number of years now. We host three programs in Manchester, we host two on the Seacoast, and we're really pleased to have the support from Mike Buckwear and Bellwether Community Credit Union as a, an ongoing sponsor of these series and, and an opportunity to bring you all together and to share expertise and, and continue to build connections um, within our community. Um, this morning, uh, we're really happy to have Lisa Landry with us. Uh, Savvy workshop, she's a ton of experience in marketing. Um, her information is in the program on your table, so I'm not going to take any of her time to go through that, but really allow her to get into the, um, the work of the day. Um, we'll have time throughout to ask questions, and certainly at the end of the program to do that as well and, and provide time for you to connect with each other. There's coffee on the table, there's plenty of food over to the side, so please feel comfortable in doing, uh, getting up to do that. If um, you haven't used the restroom and you think you might need to at some point, um, if you go up these doors and go all the way to the other end of the building, you'll find them there. Uh, we are taping today. Uh, we find that this is really helpful to build a library of these resources to be available to uh, alumni um, from here on out. So if there's something that you heard today and you're trying to recall, we should be uploading that probably within the next week or so. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Lisa and um, enjoy the program. Thank you, Christy. It's very loud. I don't usually mic myself when I speak, but it was wonderful to be here at Southern New Hampshire University. I've had um, the good fortune to take some courses here as well as to work for the university on various marketing initiatives. I've done a lot of work with the Center for Women uh, for Business Advancement and uh, enjoy working with those ladies a great deal. So it's very nice to be here. Good morning, everyone. Um, I have a boutique uh, marketing agency in Manchester. We're right down in the Mill District. And our specialty really is business to business marketing. Uh, we really focus on that, helping uh, small and mid-sized businesses to grow their businesses. I work with some large organizations too, but I think our sweet spot is really that small to mid-sized business. Um, in that environment, a lot of times, I know because I'm a small business owner, uh, you have to wear a lot of hats and you may be very um, expert in your field, but may not always be comfortable selling your services. And I have found LinkedIn to be such a phenomenal tool for creating a network and leveraging that for sales and for growing business. Um, so if you are in your own small business or you're a professional like an attorney or a CPA or an architect and um, you need to make connections and sell your services and find billable hours so that you can go do the thing that you're expert at, I think that LinkedIn can be a really important tool for you to use. Um, usually what I find is people are in all levels of usage for LinkedIn. So um, I wondered if we could just take a couple of minutes and if you could say very briefly, um, you know, give us your name, um, what you do for work, and where you are on the LinkedIn spectrum. Are you just starting? Have you been on for a while? And what you might hope to get out of uh, this program this morning? Because I can take it in a lot of directions and I would love to have it be as interactive and informative for you so that you get what you need out of it to support you in your business goals. Christy, you want to kick it off? We know who you are. How, where are you on LinkedIn? I think you'll have one today. I Super, you 
must know my friend Thelma Nichols. Hi. Yeah, she's a great lady. Great lady. Hi. Hi. My name is Joanna Luiso. I work in the Career Development Center. Why don't we go to the back on the other side? I wasn't expecting to speak so quickly. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, like 
prospecting or working with clients. We have LinkedIn at our company actually integrated right within Salesforce. So when anyone in our sales team is looking to make a call, they can actually look up their contacts, whether it's an existing client or a prospect. Where we are not very strong today is on our company page. And for me, what I would love to get out of this is that we're getting ready to launch our website in the next um, couple of days. And we have LinkedIn splattered throughout our, our website where we can connect to our company page. So I just uh, would love to know what are some tips on how to make that a little bit more dynamic. And I, I, I'm Beth Credo. I'm the director of the Career Center here on campus and use LinkedIn for connecting with businesses, connecting with students, and really kind of thinking from an alumni perspective, how do we build more relationships? <coughs> My name is Kat Hamill, and I'm business development at Acapella Technologies. And um, the company has just started utilizing LinkedIn that we're involved with when we were for networking and sales and, and um, educating, actually educating our clients. Yeah, and I use it quite a bit thanks to Lisa. Lisa has been a big proponent to get me on it and I've been networking and sales and things of that nature. So it's good My prodigy. <laughs> I also work on the alumni relations team. I didn't really use it 
But we're all friends now, and we all know each other. And um, I think many of you touched on some of the things that LinkedIn really uh, can be a powerful tool for you to do. Um, I wanted to just say a few things about LinkedIn and how I use it. And um, you know, just a couple of disclaimers. Um, the first is I'm not an attorney. And there are certain uh, pitfalls and concerns about LinkedIn. In fact, a new law was just passed all around social media and about how businesses uh, have to respect the privacy of um, their employees on the social media networks. And they can't demand, for instance, your passwords and things like that. Um, so there's a lot to know about LinkedIn from the legal side of things. Uh, for people who work in an HR role, uh, there are concerns, too, I think, about giving recommendations and potentially having that employee maybe um, change their behavior and not be such a great employee. And if you have to let them go, they can sometimes point back to that recommendation and say, but you just said four months ago I was a stellar employee. So there are concerns about it. The way that I use LinkedIn, um, I'm very much an open marketer. And I'm using it for sales. And I am very open to connections. So. I um, am readily accepting connections if I think someone is a professional and they want to connect with me for, the, for business purposes. Many people that I work with are much more close guarded about that and that's okay. So as I talk about how I use it and how I'm very connection friendly, you have to decide for yourself what's appropriate for you and what's appropriate for your business and for, for your role in your organization. Um, so I'm just going to share with you how I use it. And perhaps there are some angles that you hadn't thought of before that might you know, increase your usage in that area. Or maybe you decide, hey, that's not for me. And that's, that's totally fine. Um, so one of the things that I hear a lot from clients is that you know, they hate social media. And they're very private. And they don't want to be on something where everyone knows what they're doing. I want to say LinkedIn, first of all, is for professionals. And it's for professional use. It is not Facebook. Um, there may be some similarities in the way that the data is aggregated, but it's definitely not the place where you talk about walking your dog or, you know, even that your kid graduated from college this weekend. That's not the place to do it. This is really for professionals. It's about your career. It's about your business. It's about what you bring to the table. And it's about having meaningful professional conversations. There are 259 million uh, users now on LinkedIn, and they're in 200 countries. So. It is an extremely powerful network in terms of the power. Um, and it is all professionals. And it's the way that professionals can make and, and keep connections. When I go to an event or a trade show and I come back with business cards and I've had some good conversations with some people, the very, very first thing I did and do regularly with discipline is sit down and send connection invites. If I think there's an opportunity for me to give that person business, or for them to give me business, for them to refer someone to me, I send them a connection request. I was an early adopter of LinkedIn. I recognized early on um, in my career that when I was working with someone and built a relationship, there were times where I had a, a phenomenal relationship, and a client knew what we brought to the table and really wanted to work with us. And I'd go in one day and ask for that person, and they'd be gone. And I would have to wait for them to resurface and find them again. And um, I think a couple of you made that point that one of the very important things about LinkedIn is that it is attached to the individual. So if you're working with someone that you enjoy working with, you can follow that person to where they go next and stay in touch with them. Because there were times in some mock-com departments that were like, I can't talk about it. I can't tell you where she went. I can't tell you why she's gone. And I would just have to wait for them to reach out to me and connect with me. So this was a very valuable tool for me. I also felt um, that it was very important. Any database is a living, breathing thing, and it's constantly changing. And as Nick said, um, keeping track of people and where they go and what their titles are and which companies they might have moved to, I always have LinkedIn open while I have my CRM tool open, whether that's Salesforce or Act for You or, or maybe some other proprietary type of uh, CRM tool. I constantly double check and verify that the person is still at that company. I sometimes find that people have gotten promotions. So maybe they weren't a decision maker for our services before, and now they are. So I have a good reason to reach out for them. But it is a way that professionals can network and stay connected to each other. So who's on LinkedIn? This is a very affluent um, a subsection of our population. Um, they, are, uh, they tend to have $150,000 or more in household income. They tend to be very well educated. Um, and they are decision makers. They are senior and mid-level managers that make decisions to buy products and services that you all might be selling. 
So the people that you need to reach in a business-to-business -business environment, this is where they are and this is where they live. So um, it's really important to uh, take advantage of that if you're selling business-to-business. -business. And of course, if you are looking for a new position and you're transitioning, this is a great place for people to find you and understand the value that you could bring to their organization and to make those types of connections. Um, I have been, as I said, pretty open about my connections. I feel the more connections you have, the more reach I have. And, and that's very true, and it's very much a six degrees of separation thing. If I know someone, if I know Mary Ann, and she knows somebody that I need to know, I need to know Jean Shaheen, Mary Ann can get me there. Um, so I use it very much in that way, asking for introductions and expanding my network through the network that I do have. And you get a lot more visibility of your business community the more connections you have. So to me, there's value in having more connections, and I'm very open about it. Although I do understand some people would rather keep it very close, I, that's how it, I use it. Um, networking with other professionals is a really important aspect of LinkedIn. I know a lot of people who, you know, maybe an attorney that work in a small office. Um, they might be a graphic designer that works in their own home studio. And LinkedIn is a place where they can go and ask questions of other professionals and get good advice. And it can be a really important forum for them to, you know, ask questions of someone else that has an expertise that, you know, they don't have. And um, also to find that right person, like, do you know anybody good who could do this for me or that for me? I go to LinkedIn first, and I think, you know, we found that this is where people are looking and recruiting new people to bring into their organization. Um, you know, putting an ad in the paper or monster.com is nowhere near as effective as going to your A network and looking at that first when you're looking for a new hire because somebody on your network probably knows the exact perfect per person for you. Um, so it's a really um, important opportunity. I also use LinkedIn to promote my business and I have my business page as well as my own personal page. So there's a brand for your business and that can be represented by the company page and I have some slides about that that we'll go into. But it's also your personal identity and what you promote to the to the world and the audience um, that you have about your credentials and your credibility and um, your skills and your value that you bring. Um, and I also use this very much for keeping up with industry news. I am in marketing. I do a lot of writing and content development. I sometimes am asked to do a project where I don't have a lot of knowledge in that industry. And I use LinkedIn, and it's been a savior to me, um, by joining groups in that industry, I start to learn about the industry jargon. I start to learn about trends. I learn who the uh, players are, who my clients' competitors are. I have used LinkedIn for that, for research, in, in a huge way. I also subscribe to news feeds on LinkedIn, so I get delivered to me the type of news I'm interested in, whether that be entrepreneurship or something related to marketing, or something really um, very uh, targeted to a client that I'm serving and that I want to stay on top of what's going on in that industry. So that's a really powerful thing for me. So I can make this slide deck available to you, and it will be posted on my company page um, on LinkedIn. So you don't have to feel like you have to take notes, but I have listed some of these things that we've talked about um, so that you have some notes and you can review that you know, when you want to sit back at your desk and look at LinkedIn and see if you can make it better. Um, so regarding your personal identity, really you have a brand. Each and every one of us has a personal brand and your brand can really shine through on LinkedIn or not. So I feel it's very, very important for people to realize who haven't done much with their profile that if you have a LinkedIn profile and it's not up to date and it doesn't have a good picture, you should recognize that your LinkedIn profile is essentially a web page. And it has SEO value. So people who are looking for you will find you, and maybe they're not going to find the you that you want them to see if your profile doesn't look as good as it could. So you can see here, I Googled myself, and I got my LinkedIn profile as the first thing that came up. Not my company page, not some article that was written about me, but my LinkedIn profile. So I would really advise you to control that message and control your brand on LinkedIn by making sure it looks as up to date as possible, that you do have a professional headshot, and it's wonderful you have an opportunity to avail yourself of that today. Um, I can't say enough about the professional headshot, and we'll talk about that. Um, so here is um, the ingredients of a profile. The headshot is very, very important. If you've met someone at a conference and you had a great conversation with them and you do try to link into them and they go to your page and you've got a picture that doesn't even look like you anymore, I see a lot of people that have a picture that's 15 years old, 
um, and it doesn't really look like them. Their hair is different. Maybe there's less of it. Maybe it's grayer. I don't know. Um, but you know, the picture that you have there should say to the person you're trying to connect to, oh, that's that great guy I had a conversation with. I want to talk to him. I want to link in. I want a relationship with this person. So it's very important that you represent yourself that way. I would also say it's very important that you represent yourself as a professional. And I've worked some, with some very senior executives who had pictures of themselves at Fenway Park with a beer in their hand on their LinkedIn page. That's a Facebook picture, okay? And it's great that you love the Red Sox and all that, but that's a Facebook picture. This is for business. It's professional. I see a lot where they've gotten themselves a picture that they liked. It was their daughter's wedding, and they've cut everybody else out alongside, and you can see that they're in a tuxedo, and that's not a LinkedIn picture. That is a nice picture for your family album or maybe to hang on your wall, but it's not a LinkedIn picture. Your LinkedIn picture should represent you the way that you go to work every day. If you wear a shirt and tie, it, you should have a shirt and tie. You know, if you're in a, in a more business casual environment, I think it's fine to have a polo shirt or a nice, you know, collared shirt or a nice sweater or blouse, but you should look your best on LinkedIn because a lot of people are going to meet you here first. When I have an appointment with someone, I often will look up their LinkedIn. I'm meeting them for coffee. Maybe I haven't seen them in a long time. Maybe I've never really met them. And I look at their LinkedIn profile first, so I'll know who they are in the coffee shop. So it's very, very important. People are looking at you there. Um, it's also very important that you have um, all of the experience that you bring to the table in your profile. And again, I see a lot where people have been promoted several times, and they haven't updated that. Um, and that experience really is credentialing you, and you're missing that opportunity if your profile isn't up to date. There's a summary part in LinkedIn that I think should be really given some special attention. And that's a place where you can really shine. You can talk about what you're passionate about, what you love to do, what types of clients you love to serve, and have somebody help you write it if you're not feeling confident about your ability to write about yourself. It is hard to write promotional copy about yourself, so if you have a good friend that's a good writer, or hire a professional to give you a summary that really speaks to you. And usually after reading your resume and talking to you a little bit, um, we can come up with something that talks nicely about all of the type of work you're trying to attract and the business that you want to bring in um, and the connections that you want to make or the job that you want to land. So that's a really important opportunity. Your LinkedIn profile is somewhat of a digital resume, but that summary kind of is a little bit more of an opportunity, again, to shine. And maybe it's your cover letter, if you think of it that way, that it really speaks to you know, why you do what you do and why it's important and why it has value. Um, there is a, a whole bunch of opportunities to list skills in LinkedIn. And if you just start typing things like branding, fundraising, sales consulting, you'll see these things pop up. And in the skills section, you can have like 25 of them that you tag that you're, that you're saying that these are things that you feel you have expertise at. Many of you have mentioned like the, the changes are going on in LinkedIn. And I think a couple of years now ago, the endorsement piece of it started happening where those endorsements pop up. The reason those pop up is because folks have identified that they have those skills. And you can say, yes, they do or you can skip it. And you don't have to endorse anybody you don't want to, but it's constantly interrupting you to ask, you know, does Nicole know about this? And you know, does Marianne know about that? And you can, you can say, I don't have time for this right now, and close the box. Or you can say, sure, she does. I know her, and she's a good, she's a good person. And I'll show you how that ends up showing up. Um, I have a slide for that. Um, recommendations is a really cool thing on LinkedIn. Back in the day, I had um, you know, clients say to me, you saved us. I, I don't know how we would have done this without you. You're the best. And I'd say, gee, that's wonderful that you said that. Would you mind putting that in a letter so I could put that in my portfolio, you know, something that would be really important for me to have as a reference? And sometimes they would, and sometimes they just didn't get around to it. Sometimes they'd say, oh, well, why don't you just write it, and I'll sign it. You know? And that's not the same as a genuine, authentic endorsement. And this type of um, recommendation that you can do on LinkedIn is so easy to ask for a recommendation, and it's so easy for those that you've worked for, that you've served well, to give you one. They can do something like that. It's a tool, a widget within LinkedIn, and they can quickly say a couple of sentences about you that when someone looks at your profile, they'll see that all of these people that you've served and you've served well have vouched for you. Um, so it is a really important opportunity. Again, that disclaimer that if you're in HR, you have to make sure that the person that you're recommending, you do trust 
and that you feel that they do bring that to the table because your reputation's on the line when you're recommending someone. But I feel that if someone served me well, I'm generous with my, my recommendations and I feel that you know, I want to help other people. I'm a connector. I like to help other people find new opportunities and new business. And so for me, I'm generous with my recommendations. And fortunately, my clients have been generous to me with theirs. I usually ask for a recommendation after I've completed something that I feel that I'm proud of, that I feel that they really got a lot of value from. And most of the time, they take a minute to write a little note. So that's, that's a really uh, great opportunity. Um, so I hope that all of you take advantage of the professional headshots today, because that really is a, a great value um, this morning. So here's just an example of a profile um, with the experience and the summary. This gentleman has used all the keywords that are in his space over and over again. And he talks a lot about what he executed and what he achieved and how he increased this and how he reduced that. And he's got real specifics in his resume. And I think it's a nice example of how you should talk about yourself that you're really talking about results. You really, and recruiters will tell you that. You know, talk about the results, what you, what you brought to the table, how you changed that organization, the value that you added. And he's, he's done a nice job. So that's just an example for you to see. Um, these babies up here, those are those endorsements that keep popping up. When people endorse you, what ends up happening is your endorsements end up bringing up the line. As many people as endorsed you for the top thing will make that the top thing. So when someone's looking for someone, in this case, for example, that's really good at supply chain management, that came up first because this gentleman has done a lot of that type of work. He's a consultant in that space. And a lot of people said, oh, yeah, he does that, and he's great at it. So if someone's shopping for your services, this is where the skills can get vouched for. And it brings you up that a lot of people think, this is the person you want to call if you need that type of service. And here um, on the right is an example of recommendations. And there's a little widget in there. Um, one thing I would say is within LinkedIn, there is an unbelievable help section. I mean, their help section is actually very helpful. There's videos, there's quick tips. Um, anything you want to do on LinkedIn, I think if you're not confident about it, go to help because it really is helpful and it will it'll shorten your learning curve if you're not, um, if you're not already you know, comfortable. Um, what's an activity? An activity on LinkedIn is anything that you do on LinkedIn. And if you're connected to people, these things will appear in their news feed. So if you make a connection to someone, it'll say, oh, Lisa and Marianne are now connected. And that might show up on everybody that you're connected with's news feed. So um, if you post something in a group or you post an update on your personal um, page, that will show up in a news feed. If you join a group, that will show up in your news feed. If you change your profile picture, that will show up in a news feed. However, you can turn some of these things off. And I'll show you um, where you can turn things off so that if you want to update your profile privately and uh, you're not ready for prime time yet and you want to work on it a little bit, you can shut off your broadcast and then open them up again when you know you've got it just the way that you want it. So that's a really good opportunity. Um, these activities actually will help keep you top of mind to the people that you are connected with in your network. And if you're doing things in the marketplace, and you've won an award for something, it's really important that you share that so that people know um, that you're out there and that you're still going and you're still looking for work and that you're ready to service them. It helps to keep you top of mind um, to that network. So here's the privacy settings I was talking about. And again, LinkedIn, is their help will help you walk through all of this. But you can set off your activity broadcast that's here. Um, you, know, you can say who can see your profile. Um, you can turn on and off. That's the very first privacy control. Um, you can see, you can, you can change who can see your connections, which I think is important. Um, I think you mentioned about um, the concern of having people, um, you know, mixing groups of people that maybe you don't want to make connected. There is that. And um, when you're an open networker, you have to realize that um, I have clients that are connected to me, and I may also have competitors that are looking to see who my clients are. And I have on occasion found people that were kind of sloping around there, and I just disconnect from them. Um, when you're connected to someone, you can um, see a lot more into their network. If you disconnect, sometimes if they have a premium account, they can see a little bit into your network. So it doesn't completely prevent that. Um, but I also feel like I've gotten a lot more business than I've lost out of LinkedIn. And I feel like I work really hard for my customers, and I hope they don't jump ship because someone's $5 less than me. 
Um, so I, I feel like, you know, I'm out there and I use it as a tool and it's reciprocal. So I can't just see everybody else's stuff and not share mine too. So there is a re reciprocity thing. It's social. At the end of the day, this is a business social media tool. So keeping it social is important. Um, so what is a connection? Um, if I have um, met someone and I send them an invitation and they accept it, we're a connection. If they met me and they send me the uh, invitation, we're a connection. And that makes us a one-to-one -one connection. And um, that's where when you look at how many people you have in your network, you have you know, 200 people or 500 people, those are people that you accepted theirs or they accepted yours. And you can have in-mail back and forth with this person, you can see their profile. If they have left their connections open, you can see who they're connected to. If you're looking for someone on LinkedIn, it might say, um, you know, hey, uh, Pat is connected to so-and-so. That, that way I know I can ask Pat for a recommendation to that person or an introduction to that person um, if I can see that she's connected. I get reached out to a lot in that way. And as I said, I'm a connector. So if I know someone's looking for a job and I like them and I feel like they are a quality person and I can introduce them to someone that might give them an opportunity and kind of weed through that whole resume mill and get them to the top of the pile, I do that. So whenever I can, I connect people. I don't connect people that I don't know and trust. Um, but I, I am generous with people that I, that I do know, that I feel um, are professionals and deserve uh, maybe an interview. So that's, a, that's an opportunity there, too. When you're looking for work, um, see who the people you know are connected to. They might just be connected to the person that makes a decision about filling that position. So building connections. Um, there are these tools up above here, those address book tools. I never use those. I would never, ever, ever use those. Because basically, that sends out a blast email to everyone in your network, in your address book, I mean to say, asking them with a generic message to please be a connection. And I think that um, you're going to get a lot of people in there that maybe you don't need in your LinkedIn. Um, and also, you're going to get more people that don't want to be connected to you there because it wasn't a personal message. The way that I do it is I go into any email, I push that button, and then you can type the email address that you want to reach out to. Uh, and you can make your personal, you can personalize your message from here. You can remind that person, you know, hey, I met you at the Tri-City Expo. I really enjoyed our conversation. Or, hey, we are at the same table at Oracle World. Let's talk, you know. You can make something really personal so that they remember who you are. And again, if your profile looks like you and talks about the industry that you're in, they probably will say yes. Um, and it is important that you try to go slow and steady here. If you try to upload 2,000 email addresses and send them all out, and you get a lot of people that say, I don't know this person, or even worse, I think this person's spamming, um, your account can be uh, disabled. And that's a very bad thing. Nobody wants that. It's such an important tool, and it's such value. I would literally cry if my account was shut down or disabled for any reason. Uh, I use it every single day. So here are um, the connections. And this is a point that I think is huge with the um, ability to keep your database you know, up and current. People move around all the time. There's always turnover. There's always promotion and uh, uh, promotions and, and new uh, job changes and things of that nature. This is where I keep track of people. And what's really cool about LinkedIn that not um, any other social media tool has is that you can export your connections. Um, these are ways that you can filter, and this is showing you that you can look up and see if you want to work with a particular company. Do I know anybody at Kraft Foods? Do I know anybody at Colgate Palm Olive? And I can see who I know, and therefore go and look for maybe the decision maker that might make a decision for my business. Um, you can see by industry, so if you're deciding that you want to target a marketplace by a vertical, or maybe you specialize in a particular vertical, whether that's financial services or um, construction or whatever that might be, you can sort your connections by vertical, which is kind of interesting. Um, so that's a really neat opportunity, too, to, to reach those people with the right message. Um, so this is the fair warning, and this will, this will be on the thing I post. But you definitely don't want to have your account restricted. So make sure that you go slow and steady. And make sure that you're inviting people that you've really met uh, to LinkedIn. Because if a lot of people say they don't know you, and you know they might, um, that's, that's going to be a problem for you in the future. So making connections, we talked about a lot of this. Make sure that it looks like you on your profile. Make sure that you remind people of how you know them. And make sure that you know them, or you've met them, or you have some reason. Maybe 
Maybe Mary Ann suggested that I connect to somebody, and I can say, Mary Ann Manoogian suggested I connect to you, and then now I've got, you know, I got my first five minutes free anyway, because Mary Ann said so. so um, exporting your connections, there's a widget in LinkedIn. This is huge for me, and I do this on a regular basis. I regularly go in and export my connections. Let's say that there was an earthquake in San Francisco and LinkedIn went down. I would never want to lose this network. It has so much value to me. And I also, when I export, I get the name, I get the title, I get the company name. I can usually figure out the address, and I can usually figure out the phone number. When I started in sales, I used to have to go to the library to research companies I wanted to call on. I wanted to know about them. I wanted to understand their business, who they sold to. Now, between Google, the company's website, and LinkedIn, boy, do I know a lot when I go in for my first presentation. It's really a powerful tool. Um, so this is such a value to anyone who is using it for sales, for sure. So this is the little widget for exporting, and it's as simple as that. You push the button, and it exports it to uh, a, a file, and then from there you can include that in your database, and you can update the rest, you know, the addresses, the phone numbers, and build a database that really is more accurate than anything else you can get. Um, removing connections. So as I said, you know, I'm, I haven't had to do it a lot, but from time to time, there's somebody that is annoying or stalking me, and I get rid of them. And it's as easy as that. There was one guy I just got sick of seeing his face. I, every time I posted something, he commented on it, and I'm just like, shut up, will you? So I just, yeah, I got rid of him, and it's as easy as this. Like, you know, if you, and I have people be like, oh, I'm afraid to make a connection. What if I don't like them afterwards? Dump them. You're not married to them. You didn't go to the altar. I just get rid of them. So it's as easy as that. You can just, you know, there's no mistake that, you know, you can't fix here. So our company page is a huge tool for me to promote our business. And I do a lot of education-based marketing. I do education-based marketing for my own company, but I also am hired to do that for my clients and help them to um, create programming that brings in the exact target audience that they want to reach. And um, when those people come, they get some great information on a topic that's of interest to them. And um, I've used this many times for myself, where the people that come in to learn about one thing also learn about me and my business and my team and see my business and see samples of our work. And um, it really has helped to promote that brand awareness. When you're um, promoting events, this is a great way to promote events. And if you post something like this on your company page where you have something coming up, uh, people can share it from your company page. So then that's where the virality starts, where um, you put up the good content, and then someone that you know shares it, and then someone that's connected to them now sees it, and they share it, and then it can start really broadening your network and creating a lot more awareness about what you do. Um, you know, posting an update on your company page is as easy as posting an update on your own personal page. Um, you just put it in there. If you have a link to where they might register for an alumni event, for example, like this, uh, and I did share this on my company page when, we, uh, when I had the date and everything. I put it right in there with the link so that people saw that on my company page and thought, oh, I'm going to sign up for that. They could just click right through and they, they got to Christie's page where they could sign up. So that's a really valuable thing. From the company page, you can also share into groups. And I'm going to talk a little bit about groups because I think they're a huge tool that many of you um, may or may not be taking advantage of. And I want to make sure you know about that. So the, the company page, you're branding yourself, you're able to put out your own message. It's a place where you can share um, an award that you've won. It's a place where you can announce a new CEO. You can um, promote that you're looking to hire a particular type of person. I know that for myself, when I want to work with a company or I am working with a company or even when I'm keeping an eye on a competitor of a client that I'm working for, I will follow their company page. And if you follow the company's page, their information ends up in your news feed. So let's say that you're dying to work at Dine. Follow their company page, because that's where they first post job openings. So it's a really good way to be just on, on top of things. And if there is um, a promotion or a new product release or anything like that, that's a lot of times where you're going to see it. And it will just come right into your news feed and be able to keep you enlightened um, and keep you on the, on the cutting edge of what you need to know. Um, for a, a, a person uh, to follow these pages, again, if you're looking for a position, I would follow the companies that you want to work for. It's a great way to learn more about the company, look in a little deeper, see if it really is the type of culture that you'd want to work for. You can learn a lot from a company's page. Um, so groups. Groups have, um, 
there's a group for everything. There is a group for guys who like to wear black ties on Sundays. I mean, if there is um, you know, any type of industry, there's a group for it. And there's groups for all different types of um, roles that you might play, your responsibilities. There's groups for people who want to have a forum and understanding of different types of topics. Um, here's some examples of some groups. There are corporate groups. There are college alumni groups. Great way to stay in touch with fellow alums and know where they're going. And you know, a lot of us, the people we graduated with, are all in positions of decision making now. So it's a great way to reach out to those people and stay connected. Um, nonprofits. Um, I work for the Heart Association, and I'm part of their group, and I regularly share what they post because I think it's really important, and I want to share that with my network, and I have a big network, so I try to leverage that for the nonprofit that I support. Um, trade organizations. I certainly follow organizations that are related to marketing, branding, graphic design, and they've been a huge resource for me. If I'm stuck and I don't know the answer to something, if I go there and post a question, I get a whole bunch of answers, boom, 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 right away. Um, my husband is a builder, and I kind of dragged him, like I've dragged some other people, kicking and screaming onto LinkedIn. He was like, I don't understand why I would need to be there. And I said, well, architects are there. You know, people that know people who are building houses are there, or remodeling kitchens are there. And also, there's a lot of executives there, and they're the ones that are the affluent decision makers that might be putting on a new addition and that sort of thing. So then I showed him a little bit about groups, and all of a sudden he joins this remodeler group and this light construction thing and this thing. Next thing I know, the UPS man's coming every day with a new book because he's like, oh, you know, I found out there was a book about price and control, and I found out there was a book about design build, and I found out, you know, he learned so much. And then within some of these forums, like there might be a guy that is a design build contractor in Arizona, they can share ideas and really comfortably support each other. They're not competing with each other. Uh, Joe's not going to go get a job in Arizona for, away from this guy. So they really do share, and it can be a really powerful tool in that manner. And again, I know people that you know, work in a very small office or even they're solo, and they don't have that water cooler to walk out to and say, hey, have you ever run into this with a client? How would you handle this? Or what do you think the going rate for that is now? Is this a fair price? Like, this is a place where you can talk about that kind of stuff. Um, I also um, see a lot around conferences where you can start a group just for a specific conference and you can really get you know, a lot of um, momentum and buzz going about your keynote and what's going on. And, and then the people that come to the conference can keep the conversation going. So that's a really a powerful opportunity if you do run a conference. And then the industry specific stuff, I've used this a lot. Um, with one particular client I have, they are in uh, sales and operations planning, uh, integrated business planning, and there are groups um, that are very robust, like 50,000 members and 100,000 members. And we post a lot of the offerings that this client has to those groups, and it has grown their business. I know for a fact that they've tied one $193,000 engagement to that work. So they're consultants, and they're very good at what they do, but at the end of the day, they've got to find people to consult for. And this is a way that you can find the people who need your services and uh, share that knowledge. So it's a really powerful thing. So here's an example of some groups, and this happens to be from the client that I work for um, who is in sales and operations planning, and this is an example of some of the groups that um, she's currently following, and she watches the conversations, and sometimes people ask a question that they've got you know, the, the consultant within their team that's the thought leader on that subject, that he can answer that question. And then everyone in that group can see that that person is a leader in that area. And um, maybe they ask them to connect, and maybe they follow the company page, and now you can keep that conversation going, and keep that good marketing going. So here's an example of um, some of the groups that I'm in. Uh, you can have like 50 groups. Um, I always have 50 groups. I often have to leave one group to join another. And that probably sounds like too much, but when you use it the way I use it, it's really not. I, I, I have a lot of um, great information being fed to me from the groups that I belong to. If you're a member of a group and people post things, that ends up in your news feed. But the other thing that can happen is that um, when you sign up for a group, you're asked, do you want a daily digest of the conversations in this group or a weekly digest or no email about it? And I get the weekly, because I have 50 groups, and I think if I got them every day, it might kill me. Um, but the, the weekly updates are awesome, because something's delivered right to my, my, e my email box, my email inbox, 
and I can scan it and see if there's any conversations there that I want to respond to or that I, I want to read that article or things that interest me. And when they're not, they're not. I have it actually just automatically in my Outlook going into a folder called LinkedIn Groups. And when it goes there, I don't have to look at it if I don't want to, but if I'm like, what's going on in that group, I can go find that and see what the latest is. And that being said, if you post something in a group and people have signed up for the email digest, that's a way you get into their email box. And today, with email marketing being so difficult, I mean, the Spam Cam Act has really changed how people can email. And I don't know about you, but stuff I used to get in my inbox, stuff I want in my inbox is going to my junk now. And I mean, there's just so much spam going on that people are way overwhelmed in their inbox um, on their email. So this is you know, one more way to get in there and kind of rise above the clutter. Um, and I, I use it for that a lot. So this is an example in a group where I posted a question as an example to show um, so several clients that I've had over the years, their logo was originally designed as camera ready art. And they don't have it digitally, and they don't even know where the designer is that did it, and they don't know what font was used. And there is a software that you can use to scan it, and it will give you a tip about what font that was created in. So I posted that question, does anybody have any tips for how I can you know, get to this information more quickly rather than try to guess it kind of looks like this font or it kind of looks like that font. And right away, boom, 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 I had answers um, from graphic designers from all over within this group that I participate in telling me different types of software that I could use. I work for um, Leahy Health, Leahy Clinic in, in Burlington, and I work with their marketing communications department. Um, my client was doing a huge book. It was a pharmaceutical book, and it was like 700 pages, and it was just all text. And she said to me, I can't imagine that LinkedIn, I mean, not, not LinkedIn, sorry, um, that, um, that um, InDesign, I mean to say, is the right tool for that. What do you think? And I said, I think it's framework, FrameMaker. Let me check, and I put that out onto this network, and I got back answers, FrameMaker, 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 FrameMaker. And I called her up and said, Kathy, you should use FrameMaker. And she was like, you're a goddess. And I'm like, well, actually, it's LinkedIn, you know? It makes me look good. It makes me smarter than I am. I can test things with LinkedIn. Um, so this is an example of one of the digest emails that you'll get if you're involved in a group. And for groups, like deciding where to stay and where to go, I watch the activity. If the conversations aren't good, I leave the group. I just, I leave and go as I please. If they have a really robust membership and there's quality conversations, I tend to stay and I, I tend to participate in them. So here's another example of how it looks when you post in a group and I, I put the link in and it automatically populates with the imagery that's on the website. So it's really easy to promote an event or an offering. Um, I want to show you that there's groups for everything and like here's some examples. If you're an attorney, a financial advisor, I do understand there's compliance issues as well with financial services. If you're in banking or you're a financial advisor, you have to really be careful about what you do. But it can still be a place for you to connect and you can share articles from you know, Forbes magazine or Money magazine that you think are important. If something's been published, I think you can share that link easily. And I do want to point out when you're sharing articles and things of that nature, you do want to share it from the publisher's source. You don't want to copy the article and put it in because you could be um, you know, infringing on someone's copyright. But they want you to share it from their source, and I'm sure many of you have. You, know, you go on the Wall Street Journal and there's all the widgets, share this on LinkedIn, share this on Facebook. I use those all the time. And then I often will share an article like that in a group. If I think it's important to my audience and it adds value, um, I share it. And it keeps people, it keeps me in the news feed. It keeps people remembering that I'm here and that that's the area of services that I can offer. So this is like a solo attorney's pra practitioner's forum. I mean, if you're all by yourself and you're an attorney and you specialize in you know, estate law or something like that and someone has another issue, maybe regarding taxes or what have you, you can go into this forum and find uh, somebody just like you that specializes in that area and make that referral. So it's a really terrific referral network. Here's one uh, for CPAs. This is the New Hampshire Society of uh, Certified Public Accountants. So if you're in the financial services area, this is a great group to follow. Um, there's a lot of activity. They do a lot of events. They do a lot of um, placement. They, they work very hard to place young professionals and to coach. Uh, newly minted CPAs and helping them to find a job. So they actually, they do a lot for their membership and it's a good place to follow. This is the New Hampshire Bar Association. They're constantly po posting important information, new laws. Um, they give networking opportunities. So 
you know, just depending on what you do and where you are, those are the groups you should seek. But as I said, if you start typing in, you know, some keywords in your industry, you'll probably find a group that is exactly where you want to be. Um, here's another one. This one is in financial services, this client. And this is just a good mix of, of what she had in her network and the places that she follows. So leveraging your network, and this is where being generous with your connections and being open to having lots of connections can really pay off because it is a six degrees of separation thing. The more people you know, the more people you could know. So I have more of a, you know, there are no strangers, only friends I haven't met yet type of attitude. Um, that's me, and you can use it the way you want. I would show you this, though. Like, when I am interested in working for a company, I might type in Novartis, and I can see that they have 164,000 followers, but I can see that four of them are first degree connections to me. And because I have four, those four people are connected to other people within this organization. I have 720 second degree connections. And that means that I can reach into that and see their name, their title, and what region of the country they're from. I usually can figure out their telephone number and I usually can figure out their address. So if I want to market to them, I want to mail them a letter, I can find these people and I can get the right person. Um, this is an example. I uh, looked up uh, Procter & Gamble, 272,000. I had only two first degree connections, but I had 547 second degree connections. So here's an example of, let me go back here. When you push, when you uh, hover over the secondary connections, if you click through, this is what you could see. So in this case, I looked up Merck Pharmaceuticals, and this is the um, view of what you get when you see your secondary connections. And on the left-hand side, you can say, well, I only want the ones in the United States. And you can even drill down further that you only want the ones maybe in New England or in greater Boston. And you can go down and down and down the chain so that you can find the exact person that you want. And um, it's a very, very powerful tool. So you can filter by title. If I want to reach someone that is in a position of decision making for marketing, I, in this case, put in the keyword marketing. And I can find people with that title within that organization. Um, I think a couple of people mentioned that they do have premium accounts. I had a free account forever, um, for the longest time, until I started being hired for clients to help them with their LinkedIn. I did very well with a free account. The premium accounts do give you more view into the network, and that can be a really powerful thing. Um, and if you're selling your services, that might be something that's of value. But I don't think everyone needs that. And I mean, free is great, right? <laughs> Live free or die. Um, this is uh, an example of the contrast between the different types of accounts. And again, if you go on LinkedIn, it'll show you what you get for what you're paying for. And um, you know, if you have a business account, you get three in-mail messages a month, which means there are three people that you're not connected to that you can put a message in their intranet sort of in-mail box in LinkedIn. And probably many of you now have messages to go to there. I know some of you don't like that you have messages in another place that you have to look at. But you do, because if you want to expand your network and people are reaching out to you there, you got to check it once in a while and, and try to be as responsive as you can. And um, you know we're all overwhelmed with email, and I get that. And it's one more thing to do. And I've had people say, I just don't want to. Um, I would like to say, like, what if back in 1995 you said, I'm not going to do email? I mean, where would you be right now with your business? How would you communicate to people? Would you still be faxing to them? Um, you, you really have to play where your audience is. And if your audience is a business to business decision maker, this is where they're playing. So I say you probably need to be here in some capacity. Um, I'm asked a lot, you know, how much you have to be on LinkedIn. And I think that really depends on how you're using it in your role. I think some people, it's fine to check it once a week. And if you check once a week and you're responding, responding within a week, I think that that's fine for some people. I'm on it most of the day, probably. Um, I live there because I do so much work there. And it's, it's such an important tool to me. I value it that much that I, that I find time to go on at least a couple of few times a day. And um, sometimes I set a timer so I don't get lost in LinkedIn because it's just so much fun. You can get lost in LinkedIn. Um, Yep. Sure, absolutely. No, not at all. Um, 
I'm almost at the end, just so you know. I got a couple more slides, and they deal with um, the opportunity to use LinkedIn for advertising. And I just have a couple slides, so I'm pretty close. I talk fast, but obviously not fast enough. Uh, <laughs> you don't have to write, I'm going to share this. Um, the the um, ad opportunities on LinkedIn have been really powerful. And again, if your decision makers are there and you can target ads to them, much like you could on Facebook, it's a really great way to find your people. This is what an ad looks like. And when you build the ad, you have to really pare down what you're saying and you only have so many characters that you can put in. So making sure your message is strong is important. I have found that this is the most unbelievable focus group for us now. There are things that I've promoted where I tried um, creating an ad, and you can vary the ad, so you can create like three versions of the same ad and change the words up a little bit. And then when you push the ad out, you watch how many clicks come through, and you get some information and feedback about what wording is getting the most results. And um, I have an example of that here. You can target by location, so you can start to drill down. Like, I only want to target this ad to, you know, greater Boston, New Hampshire, or you could say the whole Northeast, or you could say all of the United States. So it really depends on what you're selling and how far you want your reach to be. Um, you can target it by the type of industry it's in. I'm working on a campaign right now that is just for consumer packaged goods, and everything we're doing is C-level consumer packaged goods, and we've decided for the first round to target New Jersey, New York, and Pennsylvania. Easy peasy with this. It's unbelievable how targeted you can get. When you um, select who you want to target for a particular ad or a sponsored update, it will suggest to you the price per click that you're going to pay. And usually you want to go with what they suggest or even a little bit more. So in this case, it was $4.41 a click. Um, this shows you what the campaign looks like. In this case, I had targeted by groups, which is another thing. If you're in a specific industry, you can send that ad or you can send that sponsored update so the people in that group will get it on their page or in their newsfeed, which is huge when you really know you've got 250,000 people in a group that need your services and you can get something in front of those eyeballs. So this just shows like how the campaign is tracked. And uh, this one so far got 105 clicks. I only paid $227 for it. And um, I was, I think in this case, promoting a class. I do a lot of um, education-based marketing, as I said. I was promoting a class for a client. They run public classes. People come to their classes, love what they hear, end up hiring them. So this is just an example of how they used it for that. Here's an example of how I changed up the ad message. And this is the report when the campaign was done. Um, this client publishes books. And I tried Surviving to Thriving, which was the subtitle of the book as the headline. I also, because these people are very well known who wrote the book in their space, their thought leaders, I tried one with their, with their names. And I tried one which is the book title. And changing that up a little bit, there was a winner, Surviving to Thriver, Thriving won. But the other ones didn't do too bad. I've had times where one just clearly won. And when I'm ready to print something, if I'm going to print a direct mail piece, I know which, which headline I'm using because it's the one that got the response. You can see how many people clicked through. So for $557, they got 169 clicks. So it's not a bad deal. Um, this is an example of a sponsored update. This is one that I had done. This is what it looks like when it's a sponsored update. This is how it gets reported out. Um, in this case, I only wanted executives. I did this class just for senior level executive directors, presidents, vice president, and above. I only wanted those people in the room because I really wanted them all to feel like they were peers and that they could be comfortable talking about where they were on LinkedIn and not feel like you know, the world was watching them because they're leaders of organizations. And uh, I got 12 clicks. I paid $31 for it. I filled the class. I filled the class with senior executives. So it works for me. Um, here's some examples of some LinkedIn influencers. Following these people mean that when they do post something or share an article that they think is important, it'll end up in your news feed. If you work really hard at LinkedIn, you might someday have as many as Bill Gates or Ariana Huffington or Deepak Chopra. I love Deepak Chopra. Um, so here's just a few you know, words you want to protect your brand. Um, remember the written word is forever. When you put something on, proofread it, check it, read it twice. I oftentimes develop content on a Word document first. And often I'm showing that to a client to make sure it's exactly what they want it, want it to say and how it's supposed to be said. And then I copy and paste it into LinkedIn. And that reduces your um, likelihood of error. But it is forever. And once you get it out there, you can't always call it back. Don't be confrontational. I have a client that likes to argue on LinkedIn in groups. And I'm constantly saying, you got to stop that, because that's not the place for it. 
And when you're in a group on LinkedIn, you really have to imagine that you're on a stage, maybe sitting on a panel, having a panel discussion, and you want to use the same decorum that you would use in a group on LinkedIn as you would in front of any audience that you are. You, you want to be respectful. You want to be tactful. If somebody really won't let something go, you can say, hey, Charlie, can we take this on offline and have a conversation? Let, let, let's have a cup of coffee. Or can I give you a call? Let's talk about this further. It's just not the place for it. Um, and it is reciprocal. And I want to say you'll see people out there that it's me, 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 I do this, buy from me, I sell that, and that's all they do, but they never contribute in any other way. Mix it up. Share some articles. Share some people that you like in respects posts. Comment on those posts. They'll comment back on yours. It's reciprocal. It's social. So don't forget that, that it's not, it's not all about you. Um, so measuring success, um, I think, if you're working it and you want to grow your network, you can regularly export your connections to see how you've grown them. I, I do that on a regular basis, and I do that for clients that I'm helping them to grow their network so that we can say, well, in June you had 300, and then by um, September you, know, you had 800. Once you get over 500, by the way, it just says 500 on your profile. So if you can hit that 500 mark, it looks like you have a lot of connections. People don't know you just have 501. You know, so it, it's not a bad mark to kind of go for if you're open to having a lot of connections. And then I do um, tag things. When I know I got a lead from LinkedIn, I tag that in my CRM so that I will know if it turns into revenue where it came from and that my time on LinkedIn is well spent. Um, and I, from my own personal experience, it's very well spent for me. And I guess you need to decide for yourself, you know, how much of that time you're willing to invest. This is my contact information, um, my LinkedIn profile, and you can find our company page at Savvy Workshop on LinkedIn, and I'll post this up there today so that you can see it and download it for yourselves. Um, so that's it. Are there any more questions or? Yes. Um, I'm going to Salesforce on the cloud right now. I've had ACT for a long time, and the last time we looked at it, Salesforce was a little bit expensive. I'm not a big business. Um, I only have five people right now. Um, but since it's gone to the cloud, now we're going that way. So we're making that transition right now, as a matter of fact. So, and there are a lot of connections with LinkedIn and Salesforce. Um, I do think that there's a potential that LinkedIn may be a competitor of Salesforce at some point, because they're kind of seeming to go in that direction. But we'll have to see how things go. Any other questions? Well, thank you all very, very much. Um, I really appreciate your time. Thank you. you know, I, I would like to say that um, there's a function on, on LinkedIn that is a benefit to you in terms of the alumni community. And we use this a lot uh, for our own research uh, when we're helping students, when we're helping uh, other alumni. But uh, along the top of the tab, you have the opportunity to find alumni. You could drop down. It automatically populates then when you click through to your alma mater. So for in my, since I'm not an, an alum from here, it automatically goes to my university. But you have the ability to change the school then. So for example, um, we'll, it then breaks it down by geography and uh, industry and, and jobs and majors. And so for us, if we're looking to do an event in Washington, D.C., we can start to see what do we have for folks. Um, if we're looking for a particular company, all of a sudden we see when it drops down you know, at BAE, and we have X number of employees, it then narrows it down for us if we're trying to work with a student who's looking for an internship. Um, a great example of leveraging connections, um, uh, my daughter uh, just graduated from college, and one of her friends went to Boston University, and she said, hey, can, your mom is connected to someone at TripAdvisor. You know, is it okay if I reach out to your mom? And so I talked with her friend, and I said, well, did you look at this, and did you see how many people from BU are at TripAdvisor? And so she set up a conversation, and she landed a marketing internship. And at the end of the summer, she was offered a job. And, but she's decided not to take it because she reached out to another alum in New York City where she'd rather be. But you know, it's just a matter of looking in your own backyard. Sometimes that's the last place we look, especially those people who are closest to us. We eat dinner with them every day. We don't think of them any other role than what they are in relationship to us. Right. So I would say start local, even. Just to, to really kind of build that out and feel that out. And you, you'll discover how broad it can be. The other thing is oftentimes in my role, I'll get a lot of folks who automatically hit connect, connect, connect. I have no idea who they are. So when we talk with students, we talk a lot about introducing yourself. Why is it of a benefit? People are much more likely to go ahead and connect with you if, they, if you've said, this is why I think it's a value for us to connect. 
So, and it's hard because you'll all suddenly get this drop down. You should really be connected to these people. And you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it doesn't give you any opportunity to personalize that. And before you've done that, you've just sent like the massive friend request, right? Mm -hmm. um, the other piece I would say um, is just the, um, the, uh, the tutorials are really fantastic. We, we have it even linked in for students. I mean, really, we work a lot with them about etiquette around things, just really how do you use it. So often people don't form full sentences anymore. And this really, as you said, we kind of get lulled into that informality, but it is really a business place mm -hmm. to be. Um, so, you know, to think about that. But you've given us so much, I've learned so much today, and I thought mm -hmm. I was using the tool. Um, and I hope you all feel the same way. It's just such a, a valuable networking thing. Early on when I first started using it, I did send out a lot of connections. And as people were getting on LinkedIn, you know, I'd get some accepting connections. Um, when the economy went to hell in a handbasket, all of a sudden, all of these invitations that I had floating out there that had been unanswered were like, connect, 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 connect. And it was funny. And I like to make the point that the time to network is when you do have a job, not when you're looking for a job. And build those connections while you're, while you're engaged where you are. Um, because when things change, it is who you know that sometimes can get you that first interview, you know, that first five minutes. So. So a couple of things I'd like to just tell you about coming up. Certainly um, as you leave today, if you haven't had a chance to have your photograph taken, please um, do so. And um, we will share information with everyone who participated today so you'll um, get a list of folks who've been here as a part of this in case you made connections and didn't have a chance to exchange cards, uh, as well as the materials from Lisa and Willer also. Since we've taped this, that'll be something that will live on our web pages. Um, you may have noticed there's this big building next to us next door. Perhaps you've been here before and that wasn't there. It's our new library learning commons. And I'd like to invite you to uh, the ribbon cutting is, a, uh, is happening September 2nd at 1 p.m. It's going to be a beautiful um, opportunity to really explore um, the vision and the design and the way in which it's going to be used as a part of our community. Um, our next business indicators, it's um, on the calendar in the program is out on the seacoast. I think actually the topic's going to be data analytics, which will be interesting based kind of some of how we've like, when you have all this stuff, what do you do with it? How are you using it? How are you not? Uh, and that'll be at the Wentworth Country Club. So if you have a chance to make it over. Um, last time we were there, we had a beautiful after hours there in the summer. We're hoping for the same in September. So um, again, thank you so much for being with us today. I hope you've made some new connections, and I hope we'll see you back again. Thanks so much, Lisa.